Welcome everybody to our community meeting today. Um, thank you so much for joining. And today we will have the topic of the talk is fact versus fiction, developing your own product mindset. Uh, we have here Mark Abraham, who is product leader coach, and he is joining us today. Uh, before starting, I want to give you a little bit of an introduction about myself. My name is Andrea, and I work uh, proud of people as a junior growth marketing manager. I basically uh, am in charge of handling all social media, PR, promotions, and so on. I'm based in Spain. And what is product people? What do we do at product people? So our mission is to help companies discover and deliver great products faster. And we empower our product management community to share knowledge generally whilst managing the glamorous hands-on work of a product manager, owner, operations, or product leader. We do that in an interim or fractional basis, which means usually from three to 12 months missions. Uh, we like to say that we onboard fast, we align teams, and we deliver outcomes. Right now, at Prop People, we're 40 in house product managers as, acting as interims in many different clients and industries and company. And we have a community of more than 20,000 product management members. Uh, right now, at LinkedIn, we're 24,000. So, one of our principles is to share knowledge generously with our community, and that's when these community events, you know, come to play. So to break the ice a little bit, we want to get to know you. So we are doing a poll before starting the the meeting. Uh, we have two questions. The first one is, uh, which of the following options? best describes your current approach to developing a product mindset. Um, if you're on Zoom, you can see the, the poll on your on your screen, so feel free to vote. In the first question, option A is actively seeking out information and resources to improve my product man mindset. B, haven't given much thought to developing a product mindset yet. Or C, thinking that I have a good product mindset already and don't need to improve. Then our second question is, which of the following practical ways to develop the product mindset are you most interested in learning about? First one is conducting user research to identify needs and pain points. B, analyzing market trends to identify opportunities. And C, iterating and testing product products with potential customers. So uh, feel free to vote. We're really eager to see your your answers, I'm sure the Mark has something to say about because that's the topic of the event today. I'm really curious. Um, I'm going to answer myself right now. Do you think we already have uh, the answers or do you need more time? So um, sharing sharing the results uh, the for question number one, which of the following options that describe your current approach to developing a product mindset? By 78%, we have option A, actively seeking out information and resources to improve my product mindset. I think I'm sure that Mark is really happy to hear that because that's what we're all here about. And for number two, we have a tier, like 33% in every, in every answer. So let's see how, how this flows. Next, uh, we have Mark here, product management leader, and I'm sure he will introduce himself better on his own presentation. 
So that's why I'm going to leave the stage to him. Uh, I think now you can share your screen, Mark. Great. Important first question. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Excellent. So off we go. Because um, when I search on Amazon for books on product management, I get over 70,000 results. And it takes me back to the time I started reading a great book by this man who you might be familiar with. It's Marty Kagan. And he's written a book called Inspired. Um, I read Inspired a few times, first edition, second edition, blogged about it both times. And in fact, I became so inspired by Marty Kagan that I decided to adopt his hairstyle. That's how I, into Marty Kagan I was. It's a great book. If you haven't read it, came out first edition in 2008, most recent edition a few years ago, in which he really describes what product management is and what it isn't. You might have heard the definition of Marty Kagan where he talks about, as a product manager, our job is to discover a product that is valuable, usable, and desirable. So you would think that inspired my favorite book or of all times, but it isn't. I've got mixed feelings every time I read the book or I hear people talking about inspired enthusiastically i've got mixed feelings and actually that doesn't apply to just inspired it's not about marty kagan it applies a whole range of product management books and i have to confess i might have actually contributed to that feeling as well because i've written two books about product management myself when i speak to peers they i hear similar stories where they say well lovely reading books about product management blog posts and they get really excited walking away thinking great i can't wait to apply the approach or the mindset uh, suggested by author xyz but then there's this reality check thinking but i don't work in a company where product is digital or we don't work in the way that the book has described it, or I don't think the suggestions from the author apply to my specific product or the problem that I'm looking to solve. And what that results in is that you get this kind of distinction between authentic and fake product managers, this idea that people feel like imposters as product managers, thinking that there's a single way of doing product management or that being a true great product manager is something elusive, hard to achieve. And today I want to talk about that. I want to debust that myth, myth that there is one single way of doing product management, that product management is exactly as it is being described in some of those books that we saw here or some of the blog posts that you might read. And the way we'll do that is we'll talk about fact versus fiction. What's written in the in the books about product management and the content that's out there versus the reality often of being a product manager. We'll talk about product mindset, and a lot of you have already indicated that you're keen to understand how we can develop or build on our product mindset. And finally, I will encourage you to create your own book, the book of you, how you want to do product management, your product mindset, and your product toolkit. If we start with comparing facts with fiction, if we take the books, and I don't know, I'd love to see in the chat if you've read any of these product management, if so, which ones. But I want you to take those books and compare them with your reality and tell me what you notice if you start comparing and contrasting. Because a lot of, these of the times, these books describe what I see as a happy path. Typically, a well-funded, healthy startup where people are working on a digital product. There's money in the bank. Yes, the startup typically 
has some challenges to hit product market fit. Product isn't resonated, but they do a number of uh, experiments and one of them turns out to be successful. And after that, the company and the product sees hockey stick growth. That's great, it's a happy path. But the reality for a lot of us product managers is a bit more like this, where we're so deep in the weeds there's not a kind of a path inside, let alone a happy one. That is a reality for a lot of us as product managers. Because it might be that we're not working for a small, nimble startup, but we might be working for a giant corporation where the sole focus is on digital transformation. Or we might be working on a product that carries a lot of technical debt. Um, and these challenges make that we don't necessarily live that happy path that's been described in some of these books. If you take that a step further, if you look at page 47 of Inspired by Marty Kagan, he talks about the successful product manager must be the very best version of themselves, being smart and creative, persistent. When was the last time you as a product manager felt that way? Or if you go to page 147 of Melissa's, Melissa Perry's book, which is a great book, Escaping the Build Trap, highly recommended. She talks a lot about outcomes over outputs. How many of the companies that we might work for still very much focused on deliverable outputs? Nowhere near thinking about outcomes. That's just the reality of a lot of the organizations that we work in and the products that we work on. A lot of these books will talk about fan companies, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Love to see again in chat how many of us, even just on this call, work for any of these companies where the product is digital first, there's a well-ingrained product culture that is so ingrained that being a product manager is easy from that respect. You don't have to explain what a product manager is. You don't have to worry about transformations. That's very much built into the very culture and ethos of any of these companies. But again, the reality is that a lot of us don't work for these companies. Another good example, designing with data, where it talks about a purely data-driven approach. It's the data that determine the fate of a product. Again, there's many companies where decisions aren't made of, based on data or the data simply isn't available, or if it is available, people might not be interested in necessarily, much more interested in, in opinions. But also think about companies where, you know, you can't experiment like running A-B tests like Amazon does, where they run thousands of A-B tests just like that. My point being with all these comparisons is that product management comes in different shapes and sizes. Not one product manager is the same. And that is okay. That is okay, but we just have to acknowledge that. Um, and what it means is that there's no one way to build great products. Instead, I'd encourage us to focus on a product mindset because that's common irrespective of the size of of the product organization that we have the mind you know the, the products that we work on the challenges that we have the product mindset is critical and that's common across all of us as product people and we'll talk more about what that product mindset looks like there's four elements to the product mindset as i see it the customer, clarity, curiosity, and creativity. And we'll delve into these four aspects, customer, clarity, curiosity, and creativity. And before I go into those, I wanna show you just some examples of people I know have worked with that have that product mindset. Doesn't mean that they're the best, you know, rock stars and you can't talk to them. What I've seen with these people, is that they do have that product mindset. So they are creative, they are clear, they're curious, curious, they're collaborative, but they're also pragmatic. Because there will be times 
when there's no room for creativity. We just have to solve a problem. We just have to do it. We don't have time to do discovery. So we can't be curious because we know what the solution is and we just have to implement it. Again, these are examples of real life people um, that display both that product mindset, but also a healthy sense of pragmatism that comes with that. And with all these things, I encourage us to start small when it comes to developing or building on our product mindset. And let's start with that first element of the product mindset, the customer. As product people, our core responsibility is about delivering customer value. Now, if you want to start small, because you might be saying to me, Mark, in my company, we don't talk to customers. It's a real problem. We don't know who our customers is, is or what their problems are, what their needs are. Well, I'd say start small. Start with just that practice of listening to one to three existing customers or target customers per week. Can just You don't have to even have to show them a prototype necessarily or do a whole user research. Just have a conversation. Understand why they're using your product or why they might need, not be using your product. Maybe do some observations of how they are using your product. Right? Very easy to prepare. Equally, you can start starting small with thinking well i think these this is what my customer this is who my customer is this is what their needs are this is what the use cases are and test those use your conversations with those customers to validate some of those initial assumptions and again if you want to then spread that customer learning throughout your organization i really encourage you to maybe take some quotes or videos and share them with your stakeholders in your organization to say, this is not me saying it, product manager. This is what the customer says. Watch the video, check out the quotes. If you can, you get bonus points if you can involve others in those customer conversations, particularly engineers, right? Who might not always be as close to customer, but it's a great way of getting, starting to build that kind of customer focus, that focus on customer value across the organization. And a practical tool that I'd like to share, if you're talking about testing out some assumptions that you have about your user, about your customers, use this simple format to say, well, what do we know? What do we think we know about our customer? We believe the user is X and we think it will solve, our product is solving these specific problems for them. And we believe that out of our product, these are the most um, desirable and mostly used features. We believe this about the benefits of that product, these, of our product. These are some simple statements that you can test in conversations with customers, and you'll get a sense very quickly whether these statements are true or not. The second element of that product mindset is about clarity. Product management is not a solo effort. It's very much a team sport. So it's important that we are as clear as we can be both to our external stakeholders, as well as our colleagues and internal stakeholders. And again, if you wanna think about, well, how can I be clear as a product person? How can I just develop that part of my product mindset where I know as a product manager, I need to communicate a lot because it's a team sport. Try simple things. Try just focus much more on active listening. Again, that was a hard lesson for me because I was like, I'm a product person. I've got an opinion. I'm, you know, I'll make sure you hear about it. But I've learned the hard way, but I've learned that especially when you're, again, when it's people in your team, it's your stakeholders or your customers, you're spending a lot more time listening. So think about the number of times in a meeting, for example, measure the times that you speak versus the time that you actively listen to what people are saying and understanding where they're coming from. Equally, think about influencing without authority so as product managers especially if you work in a in a cross-functional team with engineers and designers a qa perhaps we don't have any formal authority over over any of these people in our teams but we need them to be on a journey with us to deliver the customer value that we talked about so it's not a case of telling people what to do even if you wanted to you can't because you don't have that formal relationship instead 
I'd encourage us to really focus on influencing without authority, really building trusted relationships based on an understanding of what's important to the other person and genuinely, authentically building a relationship on that. So for instance, I've worked with people who very much care about completing a task. So they don't care about the bigger vision or grand ambitions. They just, as for me as a product manager, they expect me to help them complete the task. So anything I can do to provide them the information that they need or to un- unblock them if there are dependencies, for example, helps me to build that trust. Equally, I've worked with people who really want to hear about the big vi- vision and understand the why of what they're doing. So anything I can do as a product person to get them bought into that and share that early and often. This is the vision. This is where we're going. This is what we're not doing. This is why goes a long way in building those trusted relationships and being able to influence that way. Another favorite tool of mine when it comes to creating that clarity is becoming the chief repetition officer. And there's a few things that I definitely recommend repeating as often as you can, whether it's with your colleagues in in the team that you're working on, your stakeholders or your customers, is talking about the product vision, explaining where we're going and why and why that's important. What's the key problem to solve? How How did we arrive at that key problem? Why did we prioritize problem A over problem B? What's our North Star metric? How do we know that we've solved the problem? What does success look like? And what you'll find as part of your comms is that you're repeating the, these three things an awful lot, but it really will help you to take people on a journey with you. Third element of the product mindset is about curiosity. It's about questioning. It's about challenging. How do you do that? We, As product managers, we want to be able to ask questions. So... There's no dumb questions, right? But there are ways of asking questions in a way that feel like you're really unpicking things. So I don't know if you're familiar with the five whys where you ask why, why, why five times to really get to the heart of something. But I'll also provide you with some other go-to questions that you wanna, that you might wanna use in your repertoire to show your curiosity, to really understand a problem that you can use uh, to learn more. Equally, when you're in conversations with people and you're curious about the assumptions, you notice it when some stakeholder says to you, we should be doing this, or I believe that our customers want that. Notice that that's an assumption. Could be the right assumption, but don't just assume that someone is right about their assumption just because they're an important stakeholder or they've worked in the company for so many years, ask, okay, I see you, you know, this is our belief. How, how do we know that? What, what Do we have any evidence for this belief? Should we test it? And like I said, use your go-to questions to fuel your inner curiosity. So questions like, what, why did we do that? Or help me explain, what was the decision-making there? What's the difference between option A and what's the difference between option B and an option B? One of my favorite ones is where I often ask, like, just for my learning or for my understanding, can you please explain this to me? And another one that's really useful and opens up valuable conversations is asking about risk. What could go wrong here? What kind of risks stakeholder or shareholder or board member or customer concern you? Why? How can we mitigate those risks? And the fourth and final element of the product mindset is all about creativity. And I'm not talking about, you know, creating your own product or being, you know, being super creative, you know, getting your crayons out. That's not the kind of creativity that we're talking about here. As product people, what we're doing is we're coming up with new solutions to new problems or new solutions to existing problems. That's where the creativity comes from and if you're saying well mark i'm a bit light on creativity i don't know i'm that's not really a strength of mine again start small one way of stimulating that creativity is 
applying constraints. So instead of complaining about, oh, we only have two developers and they can only spend two weeks on this product, you know, this is a disaster, it's never going to work. We'll flip that and think, okay, what can we do with two developers in a two week time period to deliver customer value to our customers? Right, that's a common constraint. And you'll be amazed by the kind of solutions and the kind of options that you come up with. And use your creativity also to instill a product mindset in others, whether that's having some user research sessions like we talked about before, where you bring in engineers just to keep it really simple or finding a, a nice way of sharing the learnings from those user research sessions. One of my favorite tools, just if you want to get your juices going, is Crazy Eights, where, and I've done this with stakeholders, I've done this with customers, where you start sketching ideas, eight ideas in eight minutes to solve a particular problem. Again, the purpose of an exercise like that is not to come up with the right or the wrong answer, but it's really to think about a problem in different ways and to get different perspectives and consider different solutions. Now, don't despair if you've listened to all the things I've talked about. So you think, where do I start? Even with the four elements of that uh, product mindset, the clarity, the creativity, the collaboration, the curiosity, the customer, where do I start? The point is that I want you to think about where you want to be as a product person, the book of you. Right, Because the reality is you can read all the product books in the world or read blog posts or even attend talks like this one. It's ultimately about you to figure out what elements of that customer, of that product mindset do I want to make my own and how can I be deliberate about doing those things? Because again, you can only going to be developing your curiosity or being creative or being customer focused by doing it trying doing it again right but it's down to you to figure out what aspects do i want to focus on because you might be sitting here thinking no i've got the customer part completely nailed mark i'm good but actually i could improve on the communications part and i could improve on the clarity of my messages i want you to really think about the book of you and to help you create the book of you is I'll give you three ch chapters to start with. Again, we talked about the product mindset, game of inches and your own toolkit. So the product mindset is really about doing that assessment. Like I just said, where are you now? If you think about those four elements that I mentioned, what is it that you're doing or maybe not doing or maybe not doing enough of? Think about opportunities to try and learn and try again. Again, if you're saying, I'm not speaking to customers as often as I should or would like to, fine, not the end of the world, but think about ways of getting in front of customers. Could be that you decide after today, I'm going to spend more time in coffee shops where my customers are and see if I can just have a chat with them, for example, or I'm going to send out a survey to learn about all the customers to learn more about the customers that we have and what their needs are. Again, think about these people and how they've been on their own journeys, how they've carved out their own opportunities to learn to try some of these things whilst being pragmatic in what they were doing and think about what that would look like for you. The second chapter would be to think about the game of inches. As I said before, being a product manager can be really frustrating. You can feel like you're in the weeds. You think your product is not achieving the hockey stick growth that it, you expect it to, or things are not going your way, and you know you're moving slow when it comes to slowly when it comes to delivery. One thing I've learned again the hard way, and I feel it every single day almost, is product management is one step at a time. It's not about the blockbuster wins. It never happens like that. It's really about identifying incremental wins, starting small with something, breaking something down and iterating as much as you can. 
right? Really think about the steps that you need to, to take and what those inches would look like. What is, what is success, right? Again, don't think about the end of the stairs. Think about the first step that you're taking and then the next step and then the next step. A third chapter of the book of you could be about you developing your own toolkit. So just to be clear, if you think about all the content that's out there, books about product management, blogs, tweets, conferences, talks like this, there's a lot of useful content out there. Don't get me wrong. But I would encourage you to pick and mix and to listen to all these talks or to read all the content and to build out your own toolkit now over the years that is really applicable to your specific situation, to the problem that you're solving right now, the product that you're working on, the type of organization that you're part of, because that will put you in good stead over the years because you'll always have your own toolkit of tools and techniques that you can fall back upon. At the same time, I would really encourage you to capture your lessons learned. Think about the tools and techniques. They might not apply every single time, or you might have to tweak them slightly because the framework is lovely on paper, but given the we're in or the challenge that you're dealing with, you might have to tweak it ever so slightly. I would really encourage you to capture those lessons learned. What worked well, what didn't work well? What would you do differently next time? And as I mentioned before, when we talked about pragmatism, be flexible. Again, product management is very situational. So be very flexible in your approach and be prepared and ready to course correct if you have to. But you will end up with your own toolkit that works for you and that you can then start applying to different situations uh, and challenges as you encounter them. And finally, when we think about the book of you, I want you to think about two things, whether it's tomorrow when you go back to work or the next time you have a bit of a breakdown because you're thinking, why am I doing this role in the first place? Think about what fiction you want to turn into fact and what do you want your story to read like? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. It's been it's been great. It's been really, really insightful. Um, now I'm going to share my screen and we're going to move to the questions and answers part. Give me a moment. Mm, here. Can you see it? Yes. Great. So feel free to leave your your questions in the chat and whatever platform you're watching us from. Um, now I'm going to go a little bit about pro people and what we do. In the meantime, we'll collect the, the questions and Mark will answer them uh, right after that. So first and foremost, as I mentioned before, as pro people, we act at, as interim product managers. But we have known, we know that there are many questions around what we actually do, what we actually are. So uh, the first use case is as interim product managers for permanent position covers, such like while you're hiring or parental leave covers or important and urgent initiatives. Like for example, if you have received funding and you need to cover a product management position, that's when we step in. Then the second use case are product coaches, <clears throat> sorry. And this could be to coach your product management team to appraise the skills and set the personal development plans or to create and streamline processes and programs from zero to one to a hyper growth or at scale. The third use case, most common use case is product discovery. This means that we can step in to discover the next impactful initiative or product or run a no a low or no code pilot or MVP and the whole process of this MVP, like discovering, ideating, aligning the team, running and kicking off the next iteration, and so on. So 
now that you know what we're doing, uh, it's also important to know what we are not doing. And as here says in my slide, like all great PMs, we define and limit the scope. We're an agency specializing in enterprise management, but we serve client only via in-house employees. So that means we are not recruiters and we want source candidates. We're happy to share your role with our community for free and we can help a price candidate as well as your hiring process and successfully onboard a new PM. We're not a freelance market pay. That means our team is full-time in our payroll. We're in-house employees and we join after completing seven-step recruitment process. We tender to team each member's development and we run 360 feedback sessions every one to three months. Um, if you want a, a freelance marketplace, we have a partner to recommend. And we're not a developing or a design agency. We specialize in interim product management, including product operations and leadership. Here you can see some of our clients or BTC clients, uh, such as Zalando, Deepal, Ecosia, Tier, Back Market. We have also worked with B2B clients, such as Utopia, Pliant, Cognigy, uh, Heal the World Health Organization. And here you can read some of positive feedback from clients. So some of our stats, uh, we've supported around 200 cross-functional teams, and that means more than 70 clients from Series A startups to publicly listed companies. We are around 40 product leaders and product managers in-house and full-time, and 60% uh, of women are in the team and 66% of these women in leadership. We have a strong bias to promote from within our firm and attract more women than the tech industry average. So here you can see an overall picture of us. And wait here. Uh, we also want to mention that we are hiring. We have different positions open. So please go check our LinkedIn and jobs opening and you can you can see them there. Now, yeah, thank you for listening. And now it's time for the Q&A. Uh, let me see if we have any questions in the chat. Um, okay. Okay, so Alex Tan has a first question for you, Mark. It's what's your take regarding the best style of product delivery? Waterfall, waterfall versus agile more specifically. Any tips on what and how to choose? Yeah, absolutely. So um I used to be uh I used to be really, Alex, I used to be really quite militant about this, where I'd say it's agile all the way, nothing else. I've mellowed a bit, maybe with age and experience. I think my simple rule of thumb is that waterfall can work, uh, particularly in highly regulated environments or when your output is very predictable, you know what you're doing, uh, then it makes, you know, can sometimes really work to break it down, to plan up front, especially if you have customer or regulatory regulatory expe uh, expectations it's a different story in my uh, opinion if there's a lot more uncertainty there's you don't know what problem you're solving necessarily or most likely you don't know what the best solution is in that case definitely go for a much more iterative way of developing equally if you want to get to market fast you want to get validation we talked about assumptions for instance waterfall typically takes a long time to get any kind of validation there so in that case i would always recommend a much more kind of iterative uh, and agile approach does it answer your question alex oh yeah definitely thanks mark pleasure and then alex had a second question that is which a b testing apps would you recommend that have been most useful for you for digital products yeah, again, there's a ton of these kind of uh, tools out there. From my personal experience, I've used uh, Optimizely uh, and Amplitude quite successfully. 
But again, there's Google has its own. You've got Pendo. There is a ton out of the, you know, especially if you're just getting started, I wouldn't necessarily get too bogged down in, in picking the right tool. It's just really getting started. There's a ton. They're all fairly, fair, fairly, fairly similar, right? I think it's much more before you even get to the tool, when you talk about A-B experiments, is really thinking about questions like, do I have the right volume of users and usage to get to statistical significance, right? What am I trying to learn through an A-B test? Because it might, I've been in situations where when you don't ask those questions, actually you find that you don't need an A-B test and that you just speaking to five customers will do the trick or that it might take ages to get to any significant, statistically significant learnings. So I think in my experience, picking the tool is not necessarily the critical part, is really asking like, what am I gonna use the tool for? And what do I want to get out of my AB, AB experiments is the more pressing one. So I hope that was really useful for you, Alex. And then... Yeah, thank you, thank you a lot. Thank you so much for joining. And now we have another question from a YouTube user that says, in your experience, what are some common misconceptions or myths surrounding product management that can hinder individuals from developing an effective product mindset? How can we overcome or debunk these misconceptions? So misconceptions about uh, product management and how that can hinder them, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think Common misconception, uh, definitely one that I have suffered from in the beginning of early days of my career is that a product manager should have all the answers, you know, because we all think we're like mini Steve Jobs people, uh, which we're not. Um, and it's not even Steve Jobs, even though he's been credited with a lot of amazing successes, and I'm sure he had a massive hand in it. He had a, an incredible team of people who did research, who, you know, ran with his ideas. Um so I think that's that's one thing. It's not, you know, as a product manager, your answer is just as good as anyone's in a way. And I don't want to diminish the role of a product manager. I think the point I'm trying to make is often your role will be to really facilitate getting to the answer and getting different perspectives, whether it's engineers in your team or designer or someone working customer success. The answers or even the product ideas can come from anywhere. I think your role is really about facilitating that. And again, if you have your own views, throw them in the mix. Absolutely. And you should as a product person because you're close to the customer, you're close to the market, but you're not the sole kind of source of all the good ideas, all the answers to customer problems. It's very much a team sport, like I said earlier. So that's one misconception. Equally, I've also seen product managers with the best of intentions becoming what I call the product janitor, where they feel it's their role in the team, working with engineers, designers, QAs, to pick up all the slack that other people leave for them to pick up on. So it's really making sure that the developers are happy in the team, that you know, if someone doesn't want to do testing, you pick up. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but the risk is if you turn if you're really focused on making sure the team is happy and that everyone is you know functioning as they should that's not your role and if you go down that route even though maybe in the short term it might help you to get things done or to increase team morale in the long term it will really take you away from the the key aspects that the other key aspects that I think are product person is accountable for which is product discovery making tough decisions about prioritization thinking about what's next coming up with a vision so again the idea of oh i'm a product manager in a team so i need to make sure the team is happy and i pick up the slack where they drop it i facilitate all the stand-ups and all that because kind of, that's not your role it's cool for you to get involved absolutely but it's not your core role as a product person Great. I think that's a great piece of advice that can also be applied to many other roles, you know, just not only in product management. And we also have another question from LinkedIn from Stuart. He said that he loved this. And how do you stop becoming pigeonholed to a certain industry? He says, I think product mindset is a general skill set, but many recruiters believe absolute experience. 
in, wait one minute, the less absolute experience in that field is necessary. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, that challenge is real. I've seen it uh, a lot of times. I try to not uh, recruit that way because, again, I believe in the product mindset that you should be able to apply to lots of different sectors um, and different problems and different customer types. And if you look at my profile on LinkedIn, I think I'm the, pro the poster child for that, having worked across the range of products and sectors. But the point here is real. So what I would always encourage you to do is to say, to, to use that mindset and to sh apply it to, to the role or the product that you're applying for. Um, or So that means is to say, well, when you're getting to interview, for example, or when you speak to a recruiter, say, well, actually, I've been curious and I've really looked into your, your product and your customer base. This is what I've learned. And actually this problem that I'm seeing over here or that I've read about that your customers have or that you're trying to solve really relates to the problem I've been working on in this particular context or in this particular sector. So what you're doing there is you're using that curiosity and you're using that creativity to overcome that hurdle of, oh, but you haven't worked in this particular sector for five plus years. So you're demonstrating again, that mindset and applying it to the role that you're interviewing for the product that you, you're interested in working on. Great. I think I think that makes total sense. And the next question we have uh, is from Alex uh, here in Zoom. And he asked, how to best establish the metrics for the product vision? What questions to ask to identify the metrics most useful for validating success? Yeah, so I think there's two, two, two very basic but important questions to ask. Is one is how, how do we measure success? And the second one is can we realistically influence that measure of success? So I'll give you my favorite example. When you work in e-commerce, the North Star metric or the holy grail is obviously increasing conversion, right? So that you could say that's a nice success metric, maybe the ultimate success metric. But then the second question comes in, can I realistically through my product or through my feature that I'm working on influence that metric directly? So again, going back to the conversion example, the product manager who's working on the checkout process on an e-commerce site is, you know, only they can really claim a direct link between the work that they've done in checkout and the impact on conversion. I worked at ASOS on the homepage, for example, and I can only make it maybe in, at best an indirect claim of what I was doing on the homepage and the improvements we were making there and the new features we were introducing here to conversion at checkout. So I think really think about what's the measure of success? Why does it matter? You know, it's very easy to think about oh, we got like 5,000 downloads. Is that success? Well, no, if they never use the app, right? So really be critical of, is this really success or is this a vanity metric? So that's the first question to ask. And then the second one is, like I said, is can I influence that metric through the feature or the problem that I'm working on, right? So what you're doing is you're really stress testing whether you can impact that feature and it it's fine if you're saying well actually i can do indirectly great but then that shouldn't be your which i think is what alex is about uh, asking about that shouldn't be your main metric in that case you would i would suggest you pick one where you have direct influence over so again going back to my homepage example working on an e-commerce site the metric that i can confidently influence and is the conversion from a home page to let's say a product page or a product listings page, but not conversion. That's an indirect impact. Hope that answers your question, Alex. Oh yeah, it was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and then Thank we've you. got a question from Patrick, I can see. Yeah. So the question is, if I read out, so how do you manage, sorry, uh, I don't want to take over your job, Andrea. But no, I just... no, I think it's better if you can read them out because sometimes if I have to read them to you, they can be a little confusing. So if you read them right from the chat, I'm sure you can understand them better. 
So how do you finish building a feature where the MVP, this is Patrick asking, how do you finish building a feature where the MVP is more or less a scapegoat for checking off some arbitrary feature list set by upper management? When we want to follow through, there's always some new feature, hint, MVP, hint to be built. Um, I can I can see, you know, I can see that this is real for Patrick. He's been in that situation. You remember what I said earlier about questioning and being curious, really have that honest conversation to say, why are we building this MVP? What are we trying to prove? And if that doesn't get you anywhere in terms of maybe the decision, because it sounds like Patrick, the decision that you're looking for is like, let's kill this, let's not waste our time. Then another angle I, I typically take is, well, if we focus on building this MVP, we won't be focusing on the other opportunity and actually the opportunity cost of missing out on that other opportunity is X, right? And again, that applies to, that's that's a consistent thread that you can use to really educate people to, because as, as you're hinting at Patrick in that question, like, people come up with ideas, right? Um, but I think it's our role as product people to understand why? So again, sometimes that means you have to work with the stakeholders. Okay, well, hold on. Do we? What, what are we trying to prove here? If, if it's an MVP, what value are we looking to deliver? What are we unsure about? And hopefully your stakeholder or stakeholders will tell you that. And then you might be in a position to say, well, hold on. If that's what we're trying to learn or that's the risk that we're trying to assess or the unknown that we're trying to test, we don't need to build anything. We can just speak to customers or we can see how to use our product currently and get the validation differently. I think what you're doing in that kind of scenario is flipping it from going straight into solution mode to looking at alternative ways to A, get that validation, but also to understand how confident we are or need to be about a certain MVP. Because again, that's flipping it, right? There's no point building MVP if there's other simpler ways to get the input that you need to make it the, that you need to make a decision about whether to go for a certain product idea or not. Hope that answers your question, Patrick. Let me know if not. Cool. Do you, uh, Anna is saying, do you work close to the design team? Yes, is the answer. I've always have done. And then the follow-up question is, which way do you collaborate with each other? So my personal belief is that if you think about the, the kind of three amigos, you know, the, the the lead engineer, the product manager, the designer. It's particularly the uh, product manager and designer that are joined at the hip when it comes to product discovery. And that can be the discovery of an idea, problems to solve. So that's very early stage, typically. Discovery about potential solutions. But there's also discovery of around usability. So we've got a, a prototype, we've got an idea. Is it actually working? It's going back to that Marty Kagan uh, definition I gave earlier. Is it desirable? Is it usable? Is it feasible? Now, and I think particularly in the desirable and the usable aspects, that's where typically my experience, a product manager and a designer will be joined at the hip and really driving that discovery and those learnings together. Great. Uh, we have another, I think it, it's going to be the last question. Uh, it's from LinkedIn. I'm going to write them on the Zoom chat because it's quite long, so you can read it. Okay. Um, let me see. Here's the question. It's from Kerry Rumley. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Sorry if I'm not. And that's the question uh, that have asked. Yeah, so so let me read out the question and make sure I uh, understand it. So it's question is, as a product manager, have you experienced in your career where you had to, you know, you had to 
make some adjustments to your product. This is how I read it and modify the solution, maybe introduce some product uh, enhancements uh, mid SDLC, which I think is software development lifecycle due to the executive change in business priorities. Again, yes, is a short answer. Leadership has already accepted the technical debt and you need to go back to the drawing board. How have you managed it through managed through this scenario? Um, so the one thing I've learned is not to just take it, right? So I think, again, similar to my answer um, to Patrick earlier, the least that we can do as product managers, even though sometimes we have to accept these things when they come from senior stakeholders or decision may be made elsewhere that we can't Ident that we can't influence. At a minimum, I want us to, as product managers, we need to understand why, and we need to at least be able to tell a story of what the implications are. And typically, if you think about classic project management, iron triangle, it's always a trade-off between the time, uh, cost, and I think effort or people, um, if I'm not mistaken, right? And that's before you even go into making those enhancements, like Kelly is asking about, I would always say, well, you're asking me for this. This is actually where the product is at. And, and again, at a minimum, I think it's important to explain it to stakeholders or people in, 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 in the executive team, because sometimes they're just asking these things because they don't necessarily know. They're not too close to the product in terms of, or close enough to the product to understand what the baseline is or what's being planned for the product or, Sometimes you find they ask for something that can already do. So I think first thing is explain what the baseline is, then explain what the trade-offs are, right, uh, that you need to make. And you already mentioned here, Kelly, that technical debt will be part of it, and people might might be happy to accept that. But again, it's important that we as product people at least really inform our stakeholders to say, well, if we go down this route, these are the implications from a technical debt perspective. Maybe there's some detrimental uh, impacts on other parts of the product or the customer experience that people haven't considered. And the third piece, I would always make sure, if anything, to maintain your own sa sanity is to be very clear and have the conversation about the customer value that the enhancement will deliver, right? And again, you can be quite objective about that. Or if you can't be objective about it, then make your assumption that at least I would really encourage you to always bring it back to, okay, we'll do this. We can make these trade-off decisions. What will it do for the customer? And what will that do for us as a company in the short term and the long term? Again, you might not change the decision because it's been made and it's way above your pay grade perhaps, but at least you're broadening the conversation. You're, you're curious, you're challenging. And you're really focusing on the customer. Great. I think that was the last question. Uh, Stagger, correct me if I'm wrong, if we have anything else. But... No, we are on time, Andrea. That's it. Okay, great. So thank you, everybody, for, for joining. It was lovely to have you all here. And uh, thank you, Mark, for, for sharing your knowledge generously with our community and hope to see you soon on the next community events. Thank you for having me.